Yay. Perfect. Ellie, you're going to admit everybody? They should uh, admit automatically. So I see we have 45 participants right now, and we're just waiting for everybody to get on. Um, and we'll probably start around five minutes after noon. So welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to the webinar. We're going to give everybody just another minute or two to sign on and then we will get started. Um, please put your name and organization in the chat box so we know that you're here. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. Thank you. Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today for the statewide webinar um, brought to you by all three Michigan 2030 districts. We're really happy to have you here today. A lot of great information coming. Um, please put your name and organization in the chat box as well as your questions that we will get to after both presenters are done. And this meeting is being recorded. Just want to remind you, if you're an architect, you can self-report your attendance today to this email, email address right here. Um, if you need some, want to give everyone a second to write it down, but I'm happy to send it to you again or just email me if you have any questions. So this is um, available for a one credit for health, safety, and wellness. And since this is brought to you by all three Michigan 2030 districts, which is Grand Rapids, Detroit, and Ann Arbor, I just wanted to give a really quick um, couple minute update on each district in case, especially if you're new to us here. So in case you don't know, there's 24 districts now in North America. Um, there's another state that has three, but we like to brag that we have three districts that are the most active. So, um, Kudos to Michigan on, on the front of creating healthy uh, buildings and communities. <laughs> so these are our three districts, Detroit, Grand Rapids, and Ann Arbor. And we are a part of 2030 District Network. It's called the whole network, um, creating high performance building districts. So what do we do? Uh, we all work independently. Um, we all have different programs, but we're all trying to do the same thing which is to remove carbon from the built environment that comes through the construction of buildings or the renovation of buildings, as well as communities and neighborhoods. We also help our building members reduce operating expenses, which we all know adds to um, economic development in our neighborhoods because people can take their savings and they can hire some more people um, or make improvements to their um infrastructure. So we all have the same goal, but we we run different programs at different times and we're super excited. Um, I think this is our only second statewide webinar with all three districts. So happy to have all of you here today. If you want more information, you can go to 2030districts.org and find any um, any city or information on any of our districts. In case you don't know, we, we truly are a private-public partnership. It's businesses that help support this program. So we have a great relationship with um, our government, our businesses, and our building owners and managers. But it's really the businesses and um, other nonprofits bringing this program to our building owners and managers. And so we have three member types. So to join a district, you can bring a building into the program 
or you can be a business that is supporting the program and each district does that a little bit different. And a community stakeholder is a nonprofit that we team up with. Here in Detroit, we have over 40 nonprofits a part of this mission. Super excited to have um, two of them here today that, that we work with presenting. Um, so we do a lot in the nonprofit world. Um, Ann Arbor, just wanna talk for a second about Ann Arbor. Everybody has probably heard of the A20 initiative. Just wanna mention that Ann Arbor 2030 district is now serving Washtenaw County, which is pretty exciting. They've expanded. They currently don't have a cost to their building owners or their managers to be a part of this program. They offer free benchmarking um, services. And then you can see a little bit more of what they offer there. So um, Jan Culberson is the director there that many of you know. Um, so reach out to her if you have any questions on Ann Arbor. And we want to talk a little bit about uh, Grand Rapids 2030 and West Michigan USGBC that work together. There is now uh, submissions are available to put in for a leadership award for an innovative project. If any of you follow um, their program, they're very active, proactive in, in this type of program where they award people who have done innovative projects and are great leaders. So the deadline is coming up. <laughs> Just notice the deadline myself. If you want to get a, um, you know, a nomination in. And then that person would be recognized at the award ceremony coming this December, which is in West Michigan. So you can see their website there if you have any more questions. And we also can't leave without talking about the wonderful Energy Summit, which is now celebrating 10 years. Congratulations to West Michigan, which includes the Battle of the Buildings program. And I have neglected to put in information on the Detroit Energy Challenge, which is our small little battle of the buildings, um, which is really uh, stems from this and the work that they do. So we're very happy to be a part of it. We've had two award ceremonies and we have another one coming up this summer. So save the date for West Michigan. Um, it's a great program. It's really fun to be there. Just a cute, uh, quick little stats on Detroit. Um, we're currently, I think the third largest district now in North America. We have about, I think it's about 480 buildings now in our program that equals about 59 million square feet working on our mission. Truly comprehensive, involves all types of people and buildings and businesses. We have over 40 businesses that are professional stakeholders with us and we could not do it without them. There's statewide partners that I'm gonna show you in a minute. And then our community stakeholders. We have quite a few in Detroit. Um, I do want to make a quick announcement since this is all about EVs. We've been working with Michigan Economic Development Corp to bring a grant down into Detroit to help our building members be able to apply for a discount or a free charging station. I want to, uh, this is my first time announcing um, that we did get finally get this grant together and we have a small pilot, which will consist of maybe eight to 10 charging stations that we will be able to put for specifically for our building members. So if you are a member of ours, <laughs> thank you, Scott. If you are a member of ours, um, keep your ears and eyes open for an application um, to be a part of this pilot. And that is partnering with a DTE, um, NECA IBEW. They're supplying the workforce for this and it's a lot of workforce development. Michigan Clean Cities, and Next Energy. So super excited about that coming. Just wanna thank um, our Detroit Plat Platinum stakeholders because they support us a lot. SEAL is on here, DNV, DTE, and the Detroit Lions, finally Go Lions, super excited about them. Just wanna give you a quick snapshot of businesses that are involved in Detroit. This may not be all of them. So um, bear with me on that, it, 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 it keeps growing. So we're super happy to have them on board. And the reason why I bring that up is because there are statewide partnerships. We are the only state that offers a business to belong to three districts. And you get a discount called Bundle and Save. These are the companies that support us statewide. So super excited and thank you for um, helping us bring this program to our members. Um, here's a quick slide on it. 
Um, you probably won't have time to use a QR code, but it's there and we'd be happy to help you get information on that if you're interested. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our two presenters today, and then they're going to present back to back, and then we will get into the uh, Q&A. Please put your questions into the chat box, and um, then we can look at those and get to those when they're done. We're super excited about our speakers today. We're going to start with Maggie striz Kelman, and she's the director of Michigan Clean Cities. So welcome, Maggie. And I'm just going to introduce Scott right now because he will be coming up next. He's the Vice President of Inclusion and Economic Development, a great supporter of our program. And thank you so much um, for being here today, Scott. So just so that you know, thank you for attending. Um, this recording will be sent to all of our attendees when we're done, but here's our um, emails and um, who runs each district if you have any future questions. So on that note, I'm going to go ahead and start stop sharing, and I'm going to let Maggie go ahead and get started. Thank you, Connie. All right, let's go ahead and share my screen. Saw a lot of names I know in the chat box there, so great to see you all. And then for those who I don't know, happy to virtually meet you all today. As Connie said, this webinar is focused on electric vehicle charging. I'll talk kind of high level about electric vehicle charging for facilities. So thinking about the destination becomes the fueling station. And so lots of you have already been thinking about this. I think there's a lot of leadership in the room and we will get into Q and A and some dialogue during that question and answer period after I and then Scott have both presented. So, um, let me move my little thing here that's blocking my notes. Before we quite get into here, I just wanted to share a little bit too about the Clean Cities Coalition and the network nationally. Some of you may be familiar with Michigan Clean Cities Coalition, which started out as Greater Lansing Area Clean Cities Coalition. We are now statewide. And so we're working to connect our resources with all the markets in the state. And Clean Cities Coalitions are sponsored by U.S. Department of Energy. Our work is to support local market growth for clean transportation solutions. We work to do that in order to increase energy, economic, and environmental security in the United States. So we've been doing this work collectively as a coalition in Michigan for 20 years we're celebrating this year. And I've been involved since 2007. So a little bit of time here. So with the National Clean Cities Network sponsored by U.S. Department of Energy, collectively Clean Cities Coalitions with our members and stakeholders, we've conserved over 13 billion gallons of gasoline and diesel, meaning projects that we've collectively moved forward have reduced demand for gasoline and diesel and have replaced that demand with low and zero emission transportation solutions. And that is the work that we do so today, again, we're talking about electric vehicles and charging or fueling for those vehicles and EVs being part of the overall portfolio of clean transportation solutions that we support. Um, and you're realizing, I imagine in your day-to-day -day work, facility managers, building managers and owners, you're being asked more and more, can I charge my vehicle at your site? The trend, it's here to stay, it will grow into a real need as opposed to a want over the next 10 years and really be here to stay beyond that. So just in my presentation here, we're gonna cover some basics, EV charging basics. Scott's gonna get into a little bit more detail than I am. And we'll talk about your facility as a fueling site and a little bit on the benefits of destination fueling and charging. So what I mean by destination is as opposed to stopping at your fueling station, as we're all generally used to a gas or diesel station, maybe on the corner or along our route, that's still going to be part of the fueling ecosystem. However, now we're seeing more and more, as you all are experiencing, people wanting to charge at home, at work, at the other places where they're going to spend time particularly if you're driving your own vehicle, but we also work to engage with transit fleets. Um, saw Ann Arbor's The Ride on this webinar today. Glad to see you, Troy. 
And um, if people carpool, vanpool, use Michivan, how can we make sure that electric vehicles and charging are available no matter how you get where you're going? We'll touch a little bit on, on a, a project that we're doing that's called the Empower Project. So you see the logo here and some key considerations and then we'll wrap that up. Again, questions, please put them in the Q&A or the chat box and we'll get to those toward the end of today's program. Okay, so let's get into it. People who want to come to your site for whatever use your site is, housing, um, business, retail, workplace, uh, healthcare, people want to fill their tank there. More and more, as we said, that's gonna be the case. They wanna fill that battery. So that could be you. Maybe you are motivating the building and the management to move toward EV charging at your site. Your employees, visitors to your site, fleet vehicles, these are all potential users of EV fueling at your location. Again, the demand will grow. We expect to see that. Um, it's an amenity that people want. And so what we're expecting to see is that sites that offer this amenity are going to attract clients, attract employees, retain talent. And of course, you're demonstrating climate leadership. So that's part of why your members of the 2030 districts are considering membership is to really show and demonstrate that you are committed to addressing the challenge of climate change and that you are serious about those environmental and sustainability goals and you're making progress and plans toward that. So again, drivers fuel up where it's convenient. That's true now with gas and diesel and other powertrains. It will remain true with EV. It just shifts a little bit. So we need chargers at home mostly, although we know that depending on whether or not you have a single family household, you own a rent, then you have less say so over whether or not you can install charging at home or even have access to a regular outlet that you can plug into. Work, again, we spend a lot of time at work. A lot of us are partially remote, but when we go to a work site, we're spending a significant amount of time there. So if we can charge there, it's it's of interest to us. And then again, public charging, that's for when we're out and about. Where, where do we spend our recreational time or time outside of home and work? And if you cannot charge at either of these places, you're looking for public charging, of course. So when we think about the ecosystem of charging, and we talked about traditional fueling stations, your facilities becoming part of this. Clean Cities Coalitions are one of the resources available to you to help you think, plan, do, repeat, <laughs> to get toward EV charging at your site. Empower is a three-year project that's funded by the US Department of Energy that amplifies Clean Cities Coalition's ability to provide resources to help workplaces, but other building managers plan for electric vehicle charging and then move toward installations. We can be a one-stop shop for you for resources, tools, coaching, and connections. So one of the big things that we do, if we are not the right person to help you get to that goal of EV stations at your site, we're gonna connect you with those who can groups like SEAL, who you'll hear from today, and others to make sure that you have all of the resources you need to be successful from the time you plan for that resource, install and commission that to a potential decommissioning at the end of the life um, or uh, change to new technology. Um, our objective for the Empower Project is to increase facility commitments for EV charging especially in underserved areas that have been missed by federal investment in the past. And that again, may have a predominant population who gets to work or to their sites and in different ways than just a personal vehicle. Again, our objective is not just to increase personal vehicle ownership and use. The objective is to drive down emissions from transportation and so what we want to do is learn about, as we meet with a facility manager, how do people come to your site? We can do a survey to learn more about 
do people drive themselves? Do they carpool, vanpool? Do they use transit? Do they walk or bike to work? And then from there, think about how best to plan for that charging. This program is part of the Justice 40 initiative, and we're really committed and working to drive this technical assistance that I'm describing and potential resources that can come through other funding into areas that have been considered disadvantaged communities is the term that the federal government is using. So we can help you to consider um, how best to make sure we're centering equity in the paradigm shift to electric transportation. And also we have an objective of supporting an increase in career pathways in the EV charging sector. So we wanna make sure that people who perhaps haven't had as direct pathways in as others to jobs in this sector, that they've got a way to get in and really thrive within that industry. An example is collaborators of ours, Elevate Energy and OpConnect, which is an EV charging provider, this afternoon, they have an EV charging installer training that's part of a series for a cohort that they've put together to ensure that individuals who have maybe not had a pathway to EV installer jobs are getting that training early and often. Connie mentioned the EV ITP program that is training installers. So there's a huge amount of effort in Michigan and there's a lot of opportunity to have installers from your neighborhood, your community, make sure that people can get into this work. We're working also to recognize locally and nationally the facilities that are planning for and installing electric vehicle chargers. And so we can think about if you are a site that wants to provide charging, but you really wanna keep that for your tenants or your clients or your employees specifically, that's an option. And there are other sites who are going to say, we want this to be available to all comers and we're going to charge a fee for this and see it as a revenue opportunity. And then again, thinking about the ecosystem with the 2030 districts and your participation within this network, we want to help you think through and the 2030 districts want to help you think through where how much charging should I install at my site if others in the 2030 district are also installing EV charging? And so we can get together this network to think about how best to deploy EV charging in a way that supports one another and isn't forcing um, undue re redundancy. We want enough redundancy, but we don't want too much in these early stages. All right, we're going to come back to ADA compliance and some other considerations. But I wanted to touch also on this thought of planning together because there are currently several projects that create a corridor of electric vehicle charging that you may or may not be aware of. So one is working to place EV car sharing vehicles and charging at multifamily affordable housing communities along the I-94 corridor. So that's Detroit, Ann Arbor, Kalamazoo, and the city of Grand Rapids is doing its own program, which gets us into the I-96 I corridor to get from east to west in Michigan with an ability to charge at sites that I've described and use vehicles there. So again, we wanted to get to the point of talking about whether or not you choose to or can own a personal vehicle. This is one program that's working to overcome that barrier of accessibility to EVs themselves and the charging so that it increases the ability for people to charge at home and have access to that electric vehicle. So for that program, we are still recruiting site hosts in Detroit. So for those who are multifamily housing communities um, that provide affordable housing, we wanna talk to you as we have about four more site hosts that we can include in this program. Right now through the fall and into the spring, we'll finalize the installation of EV chargers and the placement of vehicles and allow for those vehicles to then be used by the residents. And so we can meet offline to talk more about that program 
but it's a great way to think about getting into the EV charging and car sharing space sooner than later. And there's another program that is starting up this fall and it's focused on the city of Lansing, which I understand may be considering creating a 2030 district. So that would be a positive thing. And this project is called EACH, it's E-A-C-H, and I can get you the acronym after the fact of what that stands for. But that project is to plan with multifamily housing sites and residents, how do they want to see EV charging deployed at their sites? And that's going to kick out a best practices toolbox that multifamily managers and residents can look to as they think about installing EV charging at multifamily housing sites. There are some existing resources that are gonna go into that toolkit also from projects out in San Francisco and in Texas. So we've got some things that we're learning from and some other things that we'll be creating specifically for Michigan based on what people need, want, anticipate and the unique um, permitting and other consideration landscape that happens here. So I don't expect you to remember all of those programs at this moment, but wanted to make sure you know there's a lot of activity happening, including the project that Connie mentioned, to make sure there are resources to help you plan for electric vehicle charging and to help you access funds to install charging and potentially even vehicles that can be shared by your employees or your residents, depending on the use of your facility. So I wanted to touch a little bit on Americans with Disabilities Act compliance. This is again, really high level. When we meet together, we can go through your site specifics and think about what characteristics are best for your clients, residents, visitors, and site design. So there are resources that exist to really help you not just meet, but exceed ADA compliance. And you know you can think about number of spaces, signage and surface marking to help comply and exceed the requirements. And then we really wanna emphasize ease of use. This is true for every single individual who ever plugs in an EV charger into a vehicle or uses inductive wireless charging, which is an opportunity coming online nowadays too. The um, chargers themselves, and I'm sorry, I blew up this picture. It's a little bit pixelated. You want to think about the charger pedestal and or cord design, the protective posts that may or may not be incorporated into the site design. Again, markings and signage, accessibility next to or near existing ADA compliant parking, this figure came from a 2012 to 14 publication that we worked on collectively with others that's called the Plug-in Ready Michigan Plan. So 2012, it's a while back, right? But a lot of the content is still relevant to the industry as it is today. And then we've got updates that we can use in our coaching with you to make sure we're doing the most up-to-date guidance around ADA compliance. This is a picture I wanted to make sure to show you. This robotic arm is one concept when you're thinking about equipment. So we talked a little bit about number of spaces and design of those spaces, signage and markings, and then equipment itself that can make charging much more convenient for all users, but for particularly those who may have mobility needs. This robotic arm is designed to allow an EV driver or rider to activate the equipment and it automatically takes the charging plug and plugs it into the vehicle's access port. So it eliminates any kind of weight or pressure resistance that might be on this cord that could impact the individual's ability to use the EV charging. This is made by a company called Jewel Labs there are others who are working to consider this type of design. This is currently on display for another probably two and a half, three weeks at the Detroit Smart Parking Lab. So we can help you get a visit to see the technologies that are on display right now. Um, 
And this is just one way you can address potential charging needs for those who may desire or require a different way to charge than just grabbing the thing and plugging it in. Similarly, there are equipment considerations that you should think about for equipment that, again, it can be kind of an arc as you think about your progress toward EV charging. Maybe an initial hurdle is we don't know if we're going to be able to upgrade our electrical capacity today. Is there something we could do that's a portable or modular unit that we could bring on site and then maybe transition out of or use in a different way? Um, one of the attendees I noticed in the chat, Stephen Braddock, hi, Steve, from EV Charging Pod, for example, offers one option for those who may need a little unique approach to the, um, the equipment that you're going to use. Um, other considerations are listed here, and this is not meant to be read specifically. We have a checklist that we work with you on. One of the things I'll emphasize as opposed to reading through this slide is we have a set of survey questions for your stakeholders that we can customize to make sure that you're getting information from those who would potentially use the amenity and make sure that as you design, build, and maintain that, that it meets those, those um, interests in, in using the equipment. Because I'm running up on time and I know we've got Q&A to dig into, there are some next steps that we're suggesting. So in the Empower Project, we're calling ourselves Workplace Charging Coach. That is me. It also is my colleague, James Leonard, Jamie, who couldn't be here today. He's got a training in Denver this week. But connect with us. We can help you to survey your stakeholders, as I said, gauge demand, think about your site specifics, and create a plan of action. Maybe you're not ready to install this next six months, next year, but you are ready to start thinking and planning for that. And again, we can connect you with other resources. Think about with your HR departments, char charging policies and procedures, thinking about when and how people use them and change um, out who's charging when. And think again about that recognition. There are some resources through the Empower Project and others. Again, I mentioned the Clean Cities and Communities Coalition, afdc.energy.gov, that's Alternative Fuels Data Center, a wealth of information, and we can help curate information from that website if you look at it and you feel overwhelmed. And then workplacecharging.com is the website for the Empower Project that I described in this presentation where we are providing technical assistance to help you plan and move toward installation of EV charging. There are resources like sample workplace charging surveys. I have opinions on improving that survey. Like I say, we can customize it. And then strategy and guidance. Um, there's also the EV info list sheet on that website, which lists all available light duty electric vehicles, so passenger vehicles and their specs. So you can compare and contrast. And then again, there's the checklist of what we can do together. This is the contact information for my colleague, Jamie, who I mentioned. He's gonna be your best initial point of contact. And then there's a team internally with Michigan Clean Cities and Next Energy, we're affiliated, where we can bring a lot of the technical assistance together, including thinking about vehicle to grid or vehicle to X applications if you want to do bi-directional charging or some of those more advanced technologies, or if you want to test and, and try out certain equipment through the Detroit Smart Parking Lab, what's called the Urban Tech Exchange that's just launching this fall, and we'll share information after the webinar about that. Um, but there are a lot of resources between Michigan Clean Cities Coalition and Next Energy, our affiliated organization, and the network that we work with. Um, so do reach out. I do want to give a shout out to Southwest Detroit Environmental Vision, who I know was registered. I don't know if anyone's on the webinar today from the organization. Southwest Detroit Environmental Vision, through community engaged mm -hmm. planning over years, has been working to address diesel emissions in Southwest Detroit. 
And so one of their programs is called the Healthy Businesses and Institutions Initiative. And so when we're working with entities in Southwest Detroit, we can also tap into Southwest Detroit Environmental Visions resources, for example, through that Healthy Business and Institutions Initiative. So I just mentioned that as another example of the real collaboration that's happening in Southeast Michigan and across the state to help you succeed in thinking about electric vehicle charging and this new potential amenity that you can have at your facility. All right, I think that is the end of my comments. And I will now happily introduce Scott Allen Davis from SEAL. We're really proud and glad to have you here today. I'm gonna zip it and stop sharing. Thank you, Maggie, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to start sharing and um, a lot of great information um, Maggie has shared and very pertinent for our state. I am going to talk more about um, the basics of EV. So a lot of people you know, think they know things about EVs and electric vehicles and all of the things that are involved, um, but people really don't. People have a lot of questions. So here we are, EV 101, the basics of EV charging. So we're really gonna talk about um, the basics, the types of charging, what manufacturers are out there, um, what rebates and dollars are available for folks, and um, really then share a little bit about SEAL at the end of the presentation and what we do. So this is more of an education and a big part of what we do at SEAL as it relates to the electric vehicle move is educating people. Because as Maggie talked about, we wanna make sure that this is a process that is equitable, both from a job standpoint and an adoption of this technology. And we know if we don't wanna admit it or not, that often the communities that are in rural areas or urban areas with black and brown folks do not get to adopt these uh, technologies fast. And so we're here to help make sure that they're educated and able to adopt using the different programs and things that Maggie talked about and so many others. So we're here to support you through different things, planning, education, helping with workforce and training. Those are all of the things that we're able to do at SEAL, which I will talk about when we get done with the education part. First, we have a video. Oh, that I want you to see. Hybrid electric vehicles contain an electric battery, which in part selectively powers the car engine. However, it is not possible or required to recharge the battery via an electric power source. Plug-in hybrids use a combination of sources to generate vehicle power. The rechargeable battery will provide a limited amount of pure electric driving for shorter trips and will automatically switch to the petrol or diesel fueled engine for longer trips. Battery electric vehicles have a rechargeable battery, which is the only power source. Forget the fossil fuels. These vehicles not only rival in travel range, but also produce zero tailpipe emissions. Advances in battery technology mean that up to 500 miles can be achieved without needing to be recharged. I hope you appreciated the bounce in those vehicles. So basically just going over the types of battery uh, or uh, technologies that are available for electrification with cars. The hybrid electric vehicle, which a lot of us are very familiar with, have been years in practice. You know, so many of us have driven Priuses and other um, hybrids that don't require any plugging in at all that the video talked about. And we are seeing a resurgence or huge growth in PHEVs with a lot of vehicles. Um, where you have to plug in for that um, electric battery to recharge and you use it to help um, manage some of that um, gas savings. And then lastly, BEVs, which we are really on a surge for and really striving toward. A lot of manufacturers are talking about getting there by 2030. And so um, it is a big technology that a lot of people have questions about that hopefully we can kind of share some of the information that people have questions regarding. These are the manufacturers. And um, this week, I'm sure you all know as Michiganders, this is the, the week where the um, North American International Auto Show is happening right here, downtown Detroit. And what is the buzz is so many of these manufacturers that you see 
are um, producing electric vehicles. And the question is, are they going to be able to do it fast enough? Are, is the infrastructure going to be able to support it? But we are working very diligently with so many folks to do that. But these are all of the manufacturers that have vehicles out now. I don't think Cadillac is listed here. GM is. And Cadillac, as you all know, is a part of GM's staple. But what is happening every day, every week, there's new manufacturers that are coming up with electric vehicles available to us. And it is really the North Star where most automotive manufacturers are headed is, um, at this point. And not just for cars, but also scooters and bikes and all of those things. So this is really a strong move that is a, gonna be a huge benefit for our global emissions impact. So great stuff here. There are three different types of EV chargers and it is the level one, which basically you're able to plug that charger into a standard wall plug that you may have already in your garage. And that charging one takes a lot of time to get charged for your vehicle. It uses um, less voltage. However, it does take longer for your vehicle to get charged. And so you wanna keep that in mind. It's less, um, it's less investment that you have to make, but the time is also impacted. Then you have the level two charging stations and you see the different types here. The one on the right is um, Tesla specific charger. And so that is something that takes about three to eight hours. You can do a full charge overnight for vehicles. So that is helpful when you do place one in your home. And then um, the fastest is the DC fast charging, which is also is considered the level three charging station. And you see the various different types there. These are the charging stations that you'll see more often in public charging places. Um, and you'll see as gas stations start to convert to also be charging um, facilities, they will be more likely to have these because you'll be able to quickly charge up when you need to get charged. <clears throat> Again, this just goes over the different um, charging units and how um, the more personal use, personal commercial and commercial use and what makes the most sense for you, the investment and um, the voltage that it will be needed to utilize it. And so this really looks at the cost savings um, compared, cost and energy savings. And so $5 per 100 miles is what you really can get from an EV charge. So it's three times cheaper per mile than the cost of fueling a, um, a gas powered car. And that is a car that has 20 miles per gallon. And so, uh, you know, there are a lot of cars that still don't hit 20 miles per gallon. So keep that in mind. More than 25% of public EV chargers are also free. So that saves you a lot of dollars there where you're not paying to charge. Even those that do charge, it's also considerably less investment than if you were purchasing gas. So looking here, it really compares the gasoline consumption um, compared to um, electric vehicle types. And so when we look at electric vehicles, period, you see the cost there, and then you see the gas hybrid vehicles and the gas powered vehicles. And so it's huge savings when you go all EV, or and then there's even um, substantial savings when you are gas hybrid um, vehicles with your um, investment for fueling or electrifying your car. I like this one. And then this really looks at the global warming impact. And so you see um, the impact that um, if you drive, and this is coming from a, a Canadian source, and so you see it in kilometers, but you see if you drive 15, uh, 150,000 kilometers, sorry, the 65% fewer GHG emission comes out of the vehicle. And the further you drive, of course, that percentage increases. So this is a great impact on our uh the health of our planet, which we should be very concerned about, and the health of us and what we're able to uh, breathe in as, as it relates to clean air. This shows a, um, where our DC fast charging stations are in the US and in um, Michigan, we have about 714 public electric uh, vehicle charging locations. And listed, you see the counties that are kind of Washington, 
uh, Wayne County, so the Detroit Ann Arbor area, but I did pull for Kent County in the Grand at Rapids area. There are um, 82 public fast chargers that are there. And to get more information on where public chargers are, particularly, you can go to the U.S. Department of Energy and it maps out the entire country. You can also go to chargehub.com to get the same information. So where's the money to help with all of this? And so here's the chart that shows what the utilities are able to do um, in, in the state, as well as what the state does and federally, what you're able to get uh, re rebates on that are, this was as of August. This is consistently changing. So you always wanna go to your own utility, um, your own state site. Eagle is a good site to go to and also to the Department of Energy to see what our current rebates and um, things that you're able to receive from the federal government, the state or the utility, because it is changing very quickly. As IRA dollars start to fall out, things are happening differently and you can access those dollars, as Maggie talked about, through various programs and opportunities that are available. I love this slide as well, because it shows where the plan is for US um, versus China and Europe and other places on the adoption of EVs. And again, it goes back to the question, how ready are we going to be to absorb this all of this new energy within our already um, uh, designed systems and what upgrades are going to have to happen very quickly? So we have to keep that in mind, but we don't want that to deter us from adopting um, this new technology. And so if you can't see well, the U.S. is Black and then the black dotted line, and then China is the reddish orange color and Europe is the uh, blue color. And then this shows us the plan for BE and um, PHEV sales um, and sales share over the next few years in the US. So you can just see where we're going. So the Columns are the U.S. annual BV and PHEV sales, and then the green line is the sales share. And I know this is a lot of information, but again, this is being recorded, and the recording is going to come to you, so you'll be able to see the slides and get that information from both of our presentations. And then maintenance costs is a really big deal. So level one chargers um, have no annual maintenance costs. And then level two chargers for your home has a cost of about $400 annually. Still much cheaper than if you had a gasoline vehicle, as you can see on the chart here. So that wraps up that information. I want to talk a little bit about SEAL because some of you may not be familiar. We were established in 2009. We are based in Detroit, Michigan, but we do have, we have three offices in Detroit and we have an office in Grand Rapids as well. Um, and um, in the Upper Peninsula. So we work across the state with varied utilities, DTE, Consumers, UPCO, um, Wyandotte, Municipal Utility, and we are 100% disabled veteran business and minority-owned business enterprise. Um, we are part of the MCO JASCO family of companies, which are kind of listed behind me, if you can see those. Um, but we work all over the place and really work to ensure that in the energy space, as we look at this busting of jobs that is coming through, the dollars from IRA, making sure that people in communities all over, not just certain communities, are able to access the jobs and make sure that they are able to adopt the measures. These are the family of companies that I was talking about. And so what gives us a, ne a, um, a neck up in the EV space is our parent company, um, MCO Jasco, has three companies or four companies that work in the automotive space and have done it for over 20 years. And so we bring that knowledge and work together with our energy knowledge and are able to do various things such as EV education, maintenance, install, for workforce and training piece and get people ready. We are ready to do that to make sure that we can support. Here, if you can scan this QR code, this is for your leisure. It's just an EV quiz for you to take um, and to see how you rank and uh, what knowledge you already know and what knowledge you obtain today. So have a little bit of fun with this. 
Um, we love to see these results and see how people can further be educated around EV and this new technology. Not so new anymore. And then we're gonna have the question and answer section, but if you need any of my information, um, it is there. I am Scott Allen Davis from SEAL and super excited to be a partner with all of the Detroit, I'm sorry, all of the 2030 organizations in Michigan and excited to be here today to work with Connie and Maggie and all of the groups. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott and Maggie. Boy, you guys answered a lot of questions I had. So I'm sure there's a lot of people on here. Very thankful to learn everything that you have to tell us. So I do have a couple of questions. Um, we're going to start with Maggie. Maggie, somebody asked, are you there? Let's see. You want to get back on the camera? Give her a minute. I am here, but I had to switch to phone audio. So I'm oh, not on okay. camera. Okay. <laughs> okay. So somebody wanted to know who will own the shared EVs. Is that like a company yeah. or? Yeah, that's a really critical question for the site hosts who are thinking, well, do I want to have EV car sharing at our facility or not? The project is considered a pilot project right now. So it has three years of funding from a grant from U.S. Department of Energy, during which the vehicles are owned by the project manager, which is Forest Mobility. And they have contracted with a company called Mobility Development, which is a car sharing operator. So Forth Mobility and Mobility Development will own, insure, maintain those vehicles. And the facility provides the parking space and allows the EV chargers to be installed there. As the project concludes, we'll work together with the facility to help them decide and um, move forward, whether they want to retain that ownership of the amenities, continue to contract with those vendors, or decommission the asset, in which case, you know, it's up to the facility. But we want to be hand-in-hand -hand helping you throughout that process so that your tenants, visitors, residents know how to use these systems. So it really is a minimal, um, minimal ask of the site post as far as operating that system at least within the first three years. Good. Okay, another question for Maggie. Um, this is regarding municipalities. Are there requirements currently or in the future um, for municipalities to install and supply EV charging stations that you know of? Maybe Scott could chime in too if he knows that answer. Yeah, I would do a little more research to make sure I have the latest and greatest info. To my knowledge, there is not currently a requirement that EV charging infrastructure be installed. There are ordinances coming together in some communities across Michigan that are either encouraging or requiring that of new development, that they make the property ready to accept or allow electric vehicle charging meaning that they'd consider that in their power capacity and that they would um, run the conduit, make sure that the source uh, or that the site's ready to install an EV charger if um, they so choose to do that at some point. Hi. Scott, do you want to chime in on that one at all? Or do you agree? <laughs> um, I agree. Maggie was absolutely correct. The only thing I would add is that... Um, Governor Whitmer is working on that because there's some um, states that are putting ordinances in place for public EV chargers. And so it is coming. Um, I would say stay plugged in, no pun intended, with um, Eagle and um, just your local municipalities because things are happening. Most of the cities do have um, EV offices now within their city municipality, larger cities, because it is a priority. Okay. Um, I have another question um, from Peggy. Is there any thought to making the plug for charging a universal plug instead of different brand type? I kind of wonder that myself. <laughs> so Maggie, do you want to cover that? I can touch on it, sure. So there are standards and there are a couple different types. 
um, there will be more of a consistent standard. There's some agreement in the last few months from the yeah. major U.S. automakers to adopt the Tesla design for chargers. And in which case, those who don't currently have that would need an adapter for their plug in order to utilize the chargers. So there has been over the years a consistent effort to attempt to come to terms and come to one. Um, but right now there are a couple. Okay, and one more question, I believe. Um, as a developer, we have a developer asking question, how do I access financing for EV chargers and the extra underground infrastructure required for them? Anybody want to take that on funding? <laughs> how do you access financing? I, I can funding? start on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me switch to my earbuds here. I had to get into my car. <laughs> so. Um, there are a few different op options for funding, and Scott presented a couple that are for the EV charging infrastructure itself. Right back there is okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, given some parking direction advice as I go. So there, um, some of the funding will just cover the units, the EV charger dispensers, let's call them, and others will pay for a portion and some of those are through the utilities mm -hmm. and others are through federal grants that might sometimes be competitive. An example of that is the federal charging and fueling infrastructure grants, which will be coming forward. Applicants applied in the summer for those grants. And so come October, we'll start to hear which municipalities are awarded grants under that. But the other side of that is um, NAVI, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program. And so that one in Michigan is open for applications right now. And the sites need to be within one mile of highway corridors. And there are a few other restrictions and site specs that need to be met. But we, Clean Cities, are actively working to connect interested site hosts with those eligible applicants for that Michigan NAVI pot of money, which is up to $110 million over three more years to install electric vehicle charging infrastructure. And so that's another way to pay for a portion of the overall project. There are certain things it won't pay for, but there is some portion of Make Ready that is allowable under the grant. And some of the other um, infrastructure types of things that may impact um, let's say your electrical box or things like that, that you may have to do. Utilities do as well have rebates for those things that are not, that are indirectly connected to um, the EV charging um, installation. So Maggie, for the money coming down to Nevi, uh, if I said that correctly, um, okay. MDOT is heavily involved in that process. I said another entity that is managing some of that funds coming down? That's right. Yeah, the NAVI money is coming through MDOT, Michigan Department of Transportation, and they're collaborating heavily with EGLE, the Department of Energy, or Environment Great Lakes and Energy. Right. So if anybody wants any connections there, I'm sure Maggie can help, um, or I can help too. So uh, thank you. That's a lot of information. Um, very informative. We've got a couple, couple great, great um, comments here. And just reading through the notes here, make sure I didn't miss anybody else's question. We're ending a little early, which is okay. I, I did put in an extra 15 minutes because sometimes we go a little longer, but um, I think we got it all done in an hour. So um, we will be sending this out tomorrow, uh, hopefully, the link. And you can see the recording again and you can share it and I'm sure that Scott and Maggie and myself and the other two 2030 districts are happy to answer any questions that you guys may have so thank you so much for presenting uh, Scott and Maggie and thank you everybody for attending and we look forward to seeing you around I personally find it very exciting what we're doing um, in Michigan and Detroit around EV and 
I think since the automakers are here, we need to be leading the way. So I think we're a step ahead of the tw other 20, 30 districts that are in, um, in Michigan. So that's exciting for us. So um, glad to have all of you here today and have a great afternoon. Thanks for attending. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you, Maggie. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Have a great one.